So I believe you enjoyed the part two of our lesson on defamation. Remember we discussed in the immediate video the elements of defamation. That is, if a matter went to court, what were the things that had to be proved by the claimant or the plaintiff to establish the fact that he or she has been defamed? We looked at three of them. And remember there was an important aspect of it. That was where we got to in the part two of the video. That was, the defendant shouldn't have any defense. And the other part said that, in the case where there is a defense of qualified privilege, it should be shown by the plaintiff that the person or the defendant was actuated by malice. Now in this video, we are going to discuss the defenses to defamation. That is, on the side of the defendant, if someone has brought an action against defamation against him or her, or if it is you that someone has brought an action against defamation, what are some of the defenses that you can rely on in court or you can plead in your statement of defense before the court so that it can absolve you from damages or at least mitigate those damages? What are those defenses? We are going to discuss about four of them. One is justification. Two, absolute privilege. Three, qualified privilege. Four, fair comment. There are others like consent, but we'll focus principally on these four defenses because those are the ones that are mostly common and relied upon by people who seek to resist an action in defamation. First is justification. What is justification? Now, in an action for defamation, that is, if someone has sued you or sued another person because he felt that he had been defamed, the defendant could rely on the defense of justification. Justification is the legal term for absolute truth. When you plead justification or you mount a defense of justification, what the defendant seeks to tell the court is that everything that he has said in that particular statement, word or action or conduct, was justified or it is absolutely true in its essence. That is justification. So if, for example, someone accuses another person or imputes to him that this guy is a thief, this man there, he's corrupt, and the plaintiff, the one who feels defamed by that action, takes the matter to court, anyone who pleads justification as a defense ought to show in court that that statement that he said that the person is a thief, he has real and credible evidence to back it. That is justification. It is absolute truth. So if you say that you are using the defense of justification or someone relies on the defense of justification, the statement ought to be true in a substance. Now, in a case which is known as Boache versus Samai, these are the, some of the bits of the facts of the case. Now, there was this assistant director of education in one part of the country, somewhere in Sunyane. There was another headmistress who had been posted within the region of the assistant director, the assistant director's jurisdiction within that area. Now, the husband of the headmistress said that he had feelings or had grounds to believe that the assistant director was having a morals or adulterous affair with his wife, the headmistress. So what did this married man do? He took up a pen and paper and wrote an extensive complaint about the assistant director of education and forwarded it to the regional director of education in the Brunahafo region, complaining that the assistant director was having an adulterous affair with his wife. The assistant director took issues with that and said that the husband had defamed him. So he sued him and took the matter to court. In court, the husband used or relied on the, the defense of justification. Of course, he added another defense too. But what did the court find relative to the answers of justification? What the court said that he has been unable to establish that all the statements or the allegations that he had made against the assistant director were true. And therefore, his plea of justification failed. The point, ladies and gentlemen, is that when someone pleads justification as a defense and action in defamation, we are saying that you should be sure that all the story or whatever you claim is the case is absolutely true in its essence. Of course, there may be a bit of it, 
that may not actually fit. But in essence, it should be true. All substantial and material aspects of the statement of conduct should actually reflect what the person intends to claim. So if you accuse another person, if someone labels someone as a prostitute, and the person sues you for defamation, be prepared to show that actually you have evidence to back your claim that he's indeed a prostitute. If you say that a judge is a liar and an action for defamation is brought against you, anyone who pleads the defense of justification ought to show that truly and surely that statement that he imputes that the judge is a liar is actually true. So in justification, it's absolute truth and nothing else. We don't want half truth. We want absolute truth. That is the defense of justification. Two, absolute privilege. What is absolute privilege? Now, under the law of defamation, when we say an absolute privilege, we are referring to statements or conducts that are made in places or in platforms that the law actually provides that platform for free speech, so to speak. I'll give you an example. Platforms or privileges that we describe as absolute include one, judicial hearings or judicial proceedings. That is, if matters have been brought to court. Now, if someone takes a matter to court or a matter is being heard in court, whatever statement that is passed during the judicial hearing is protected by absolute privilege. The statement by the judge, the statement by the jury, the statement by the complainants, the statement by the witnesses, all that is bound by what we call an absolute privilege. So someone cannot just take an action against defamation against someone who has made statements during a court proceeding. It doesn't happen. So maybe the person comes here and it's a court proceeding, then maybe the witness is being asked a question. So, sir, you say A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Then he makes a statement in there. That statement that is made within um, the judicial setting is what we refer to as um, absolute privilege. So judicial settings or judicial proceedings are like that. It is also important to understand that the authorities or the law is also that any matter that is also consequent to the judicial proceeding itself it is also bound by an absolute privilege. Let's take for example if a suspect is brought to a police station or a witness is brought before a police or any kind of um, police investigating process. And the purpose of the investigation is to probably put up the final touches and have the complete charge document put before the court. Now, that is not a court hearing. You understand that? That matter is not happening within court. But because those statements are being made, pursuant to a court proceedings that ought to be commenced, that is also part of what we call judicial proceedings. So if someone goes to make a statement to a police, he gives a statement to a police and he makes some statement that a third person feels that those statements has defamed him. He cannot take an action of defamation against him and take him to court that, oh, when you went to the police station, you said A, B, and C, and D. All those are part of what we refer to as judicial proceedings. Okay? So once it is a natural and consequence of a judicial action, we are saying that it is bound by absolute privilege. I hasten to add that is. If someone brings an action against you or another person in defamation, his defense could be an absolute privilege in the sense that if it was made within a judicial proceeding setting, he can rely on the defense of absolute privilege. Also within absolute privilege is what we refer to as parliamentary proceedings in the floor of parliament. Here in Ghana, sometimes you may see parliamentarians engaging in some heated banter here and there. Now, that is an absolute privilege. So if on the floor of parliament, one parliamentarian accuses another parliamentarian, Mr. Speaker, that parliamentarian or this parliamentarian is a liar. He makes it on the floor of parliament. The question is, can that parliamentarian who feels offended or who feels defamed by that action go to court and institute an action for defamation against him? He could do that. But the defense that the defendant could rely on is the defense of, of uh, the defense of absolute privilege. That is, that statement was made within a permissible space. The law allows matters that are made within parliament to be guarded by absolute privilege. Of course, 
in our Ghanaian parliament, the Privileges Committee may choose to take up such matters so that they deal with it internally. But such an action can't go to the court because someone has said a statement on parliament, okay, uh, on the floor of parliament. Okay. It also includes parliamentary reports, okay, parliamentary reports, so the parliamentary hands are, and all other subsidiary meetings or organizations by parliament. So, for example, you know here in our Ghanaian parliament, if the president nominates someone for appointment as a minister, he appears before a vetting committee, okay? If someone is selected as, um, as, as a justice of the Supreme Court, he appears before the parliamentary vetting committee of a sort, and many, many other such appointments. Now, in the course of that vetting committee, you realize that here we now part of in Ghana, there are questions that go left, right, center, that the acts of the person. If a statement comes up within that vetting committee process, that is a parliamentary proceeding. You cannot take that action outside of parliament and institute an action for defamation. The, the defense that a person can rely on is what we refer to as absolute privilege. Okay. Also part of um, an extension of some of these absolute privileges may also be committees of inquiries or commissions of inquiry. You know in the Constitution, 1992, it says that the president has the power to institute commissions of inquiry into matters of public interest. So situations may happen. Maybe there is a fire, there is some scandal, and the commission of inquiry is, is, is put together. Now, when people appear before the commissions of inquiry, because it is the law that has created that platform for that discussion, it is an absolute privilege occasion. The government makes a statement on the floor of a commission of inquiry. That statement cannot be taken out and be used in instituting a defamation action. Okay? If anyone does that, the person who feels affected can now plead the defense of absolute privilege for committees of inquiry. It may also, under absolute privilege, have other situations like other quasi-judicial bodies. For example, court martial in the armed forces. When a soldier does something that is, in the, in, the, in the typical language of the armed forces, prejudicial to good order and discipline, he is put before the court martial. If a statement goes before the court martial, it's an absolute privilege. If a matter goes before Shraj, the Committee of Human Rights and Administrative Justice, and they have any sense. So we understand what we mean by absolute privilege. That is it. You cannot rely on matters or stories or conduct that has popped up on an absolute privilege occasion and institute an action of defamation. The defendant can't plead the defense of absolute privilege, and that would take away the, the, the establishment of a defamatory action. Are we okay? So that is the second point on absolute privilege. The third defense that can be relied on it's what we call qualified privilege. Now, you remember that when we refer to the Benjamin Dufour versus the Bank of Ghana and Graphic Communication Group Limited, and we mentioned that the Supreme Court has reordered the elements that had to be shown in court to establish an action for defamation, the sixth and final one mentioned that if there is a defense of qualified privilege, the plaintiff ought to show that the defendant was actuated by malice in that, okay? So you know what qualified privilege is from that point. But what exactly, guys, is qualified privilege? The authorities are, the authorities are to this effect. When we say qualified privilege, we are saying that there are some situations in which between two persons, let's call A and B, A owes B a legal moral or social duty to pass on some information to him. B also has a corresponding interest in that particular kind of information. We are saying that where there exists that legal, moral, or social duty, there is what we call a qualified privilege. We okay. Let me give you an example. Let's say there is a minor, a 16-year-old girl, who is probably seeing a 65-year-old man Someone sees the 65-year-old man walking with this 16-year-old girl, and he feels, ah, why should this old man be doing this? He knows the old man. So he sees that story, or he sees that action, then he goes to report the old man to the girl's father. The question, can the old man now bring an action, against, an action in defamation against the girl's father or against this particular person? 
this person who saw the amorous affair and probably reported to the girl's father, the minor's father, can you bring an action against defamation? He may be able to bring that action. But the question is, that what is going to be the defense that this informant will rely on? Qualified privilege. Why? Because he reported the matter to the girl's father. There is a social connection and bonding between a ward and the parent. So if someone sees an action that he feels that it is socially reprehensible, despicable, then he reports the matter to that infant or minor's guardian. That is an expression of social or moral responsibility. Hope you understand that. So we are saying that if someone owes another person a social duty, and by virtue of that social, legal, or moral duty, he passes on some information to them, and the person also correspondingly with that interest receives that information, we call that qualified privilege. I'll give another example to uh, illustrate this point. Let's take a junior officer, a lance corporal, in the military. Then he sees another action of a, a soldier. Then he reports that action to his superior, who is probably um, a superintendent or something like that, any of the, any of the higher ranking officers. Now, the person who feels that he has been reported on, can he now claim defamation against the person who made the report against the informant? What is going to be his defense? He is going to plead the defense of what we call qualified privilege. Why? Because as a last corporal, he has a legal duty to give such information that is reasonable or antecedent to his work, to his superior. So if he hears the story and he tells his boss, that is qualified privilege. The law is saying that that is a defense. Okay? The law is saying that that is a defense. So if someone is pleading qualified privilege, what we are trying to say is that he feels that because of the legal or moral or social duty that is imposed on him, he has the right to disclose this particular information to another person. I'll give you a very final example in our customary sense. In our local parlance, you know maybe in the community that you may live, you may have what we call, what we call the family head, the Akans call the Ebusu Apenyin. Mostly in the social context of the Akan, the Ebusu Apenyin is the family head, the one who is generally responsible for the welfare of the general members of the family. So let's say A and B are having some marital dispute. Maybe one person is, is caught in some amorous affair with another person. The pair, uh, one um, C sees the situation and chooses to report the matter to the Abu Zuyapeni. The question is, what defense will he be able to rely on if an action for defamation is brought against him? The question is that, does he have a social duty to report that matter to the family head? He does have a social duty, though it may not be legal per se, but it's a social duty. That is what the society knows. So if someone goes to tell a story to his family head, you cannot just say that he has done something wrong. That is what we refer to as qualified privilege. We okay? But now watch. The definition or the element says that if there is a plea of qualified privilege, you can displace that defense if the plaintiff is able to show that the person was actuated by malice. So the question is that what is malice in this case? Such that it will be able to be used to dispel the defense of qualified privilege. What is malice? So when we mention malice, what are we trying to say? Now, malice to the extent that it is used in the definition or in the requirement that if someone relies on qualified privilege, you can only dispel that defense of qualified privilege if the plaintiff can prove malice. Malice includes the absence of a general belief in the truthfulness of the statement. It can be by malice. So if someone makes a statement, okay, under qualified privilege, and he, he tries to put up a defense of malice, if the plaintiff wants to fight against that defense, he should be able to show that, oh, it is true. He made that statement on the basis of qualified privilege, but yet he lacked the belief in the truthfulness of the statement. So remember the Boachi versus Salman case. That was what happened. Now, Boachi brought an action against Salman because Salman, the husband of the headmistress, had reported him to his superior that he suspects him of having some amorous affair. Now, the interesting thing is that Salman 
the husband, succeeded. Why? Because Boachi was not able to establish that the husband was motivated by malice. That is, he didn't have real reason to believe that what he was saying was true. Of course, there were situations and instances that he had detailed, that he saw him in some compromising position with his wife. And therefore, any reasonable person could have the proper grounds to assume that he had something amorous to do with his wife. Therefore, that issue of malice was not shown by Boache, and, the, and hence, the defense of qualified privilege was sustained by the court. You get that. So, absence of belief in the truth of the statement could be um, proof of malice. It could also be spite. The person may just have some bit of ill will or distaste or dislike for the person. If that is the reason for which he used the qualified privilege, then we can say that the matter will still be used as, uh, or could, could now still hold as being defamatory. So this is it. For example, the mode of publication could be grounds of malice. When we say mode of publication, what do we mean by that? The mode of publication is that to what extent was it necessary in the person making that kind of complaint? So let's see. A is indebted to B. Like A has had taken some money from B, okay? So B met A somewhere and told A that, look, A, I want my money back. A told B, look, I'm going to give you your money. You just give me about one week. That is fine. What does B do? B, still not feeling comfortable by the fact that A hadn't given him his money. He goes and discloses the debt situation to A's wife. He goes to tell A's pastor. He goes to tell A's boss. The question is that, that simple debt transaction that he was engaged in, and he had made assurances that he was going to get back to him in one week, they didn't warrant him be reporting all those matters to that wide range of people. You understand that? So we are saying that if the mode of publication, it is too wide than necessary, it could be grounds of what? Malice. Let's say, for example, even someone is indebted to another person. Let's still use the same example. So he finds him somewhere along the road or in the famous community or a bar or something like that. Then he begins screaming, shouting on top of his voice, give me my money, give me my money, give me my money. You imagine that. Trying to ask, we know in our local parents, create a scene. It is true that there is qualified privilege. Qualified privilege in there will mean that there is some kind of pressing need, okay, between the two of them. But malice can be imputed in there, in the sense that, was it really necessary for him to actually use that kind of strenuous, loud shouts in trying to make his claim? So all these are examples of proofs of what? Malice. So we are saying that when we say malice, we are referring to the absence of genuine belief in the truthfulness of the statement, which may be inspired by ill will or spite. It may also be seen in the mode of publication where the matter is made, it is published in a, in, in, in a very wide manner than it is necessary. All that can be, um, 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 can, can be also be grounds of malice. Okay? And also, there is also the, 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 the aspect of relevance. If someone is making a statement and the statement that he makes, he adds up certain statements that are not relevant to the main cause, it may also be grounds of malice. So to sum up the issue of qualified privilege, in the locus classicus case of Too Good versus Byron, Baron Park had this to say when he mentioned the issue of qualified privilege in Too Good versus Byron. Let's see. In referring to qualified privilege, or qualified privilege in this statement, it says that unless it is fairly made by a person in the discharge of some public or private duty, whether legal or moral, or in conduct of his own affairs, in matters where his interest is concerned. Did you see that? So in matters of private or public interest, where his interest is concerned. You should be able to show that for qualified privilege. So, for example, radio stations, publications, media, they have a social duty. And what is their social duty? The social duty to the public is to inform us of what is going on. So if someone 
hears a story about himself being published in social media or by a radio station, and you bring an action of defamation against the radio station, okay? The radio station or the media house can raise the defense of qualified privilege. That is, it is a subject matter of public interest. The public need to know about what is saying. So the only way that you can dispel that defense of qualified privileges is to be able to establish malice in the action of the media house. That is, when they made that statement, they didn't take the opportunity to even, for example, cross-check it. It could be evidence of malice. Or they published it in, a, in an extent that was too wide than was necessary. Gave it too much prominence that was necessary. All that can be examples of what we say um, malice being um, actuating and dispelling the idea of qualified privilege. Hope you understand that. So in qualified privilege, we are trying to say that, again, if there is a legal, moral or social duty for A to disclose a matter to B, and B also has a corresponding duty to take that, we can say that it's qualified privilege. And we've given you so many instances of that. Okay? And the two good versus aspiring case mentions that if it is a matter of public interest, and rightly so, it could also be a proper defense of qualified privilege, said that it can be used to defend an action against defamation. The final one is fair comment. Now, when we say fair comment, what do we mean? A fair comment, again, simply, will refer to comments that a person may make relative to matters of public interest. Now, if you read the Benjamin Dufour versus the BOG case, Professor Henry Tamensa Bonsu explained in great detail what we mean by public interest. Now, in public interest, we are referring to things that are subject to the ways and life of public officials. Okay? So if there is a statement or a story about a public figure, okay, a person whose work and the things that he does affect substantially the work of the public, he may be a minister, he may be a president, he may be a chief, he may be a certain person of high social standing, he may even be a celebrity, a musician, a songstress, an artist, a famous individual, his life will be matters of public interest. Why? Because what he does affects substantially what the public, um, how the public sees him. So if stories about the person should come out, or the media or people speak about those, the defense of fair comment could be, could, could be used. So for example, a popular musician, musician K, and someone says that, oh, this musician, he likes women, okay? Now, that musician cannot just take an action for defamation against the person that, or a radio station or, or a media house who tells the public that they said that he's a womanizer. Okay, all right. So we may ask ourselves that, did they make that comment fairly? So fair comments will mean that the facts upon which you make supplementary comments, the facts will be true. So when the facts of which you make the comments are false, then the defense of fair comments wouldn't come. That is why you would realize that in many, many media houses, when the story comes out, they first have to double-check the story. Know that those particular facts in the story are true. So if the facts are true, any other supplementary and reasonable comments that people may make on it, they can, the defense of fair comment can be used. So as a public figure, you cannot say that we should not talk about you on radio. We, they will talk about you. They will talk about your life. They will talk about the things that you are engaged in. It's just that the defense of fair comments will be used in there. That is, all the matters that is being said are done fairly. Okay, and we are saying that that means that the facts upon which that they were based were also true. And again, the issue of relevance also comes in. When we say relevance, what, what do we mean? Any comment that is fair should be comments that are made relevant to the subject matter. If, for example, there is a minister or a government official or a public figure, person in public life, Okay, obviously public life, you, uh, you occupy some, some, some kind of um, public institution of a sort. Let's say there's a scandal, an alleged scandal, conducting, re referencing to maybe how he might have probably used some money that was entrusted in the scare. And in the discussion, we are talking about how he has used the money, and the fact that he probably personally good in due process. Then someone in making a contribution to that story says that, no, oh, I know him. Was he not the one who was chasing those girls in the university and all that, you know, tries to bring up a story about his personal and amorous life? Now, the question is that you are talking about his action relative to his work. What has his private life there got to do with that particular action? 
So we ask ourselves that. That commentary that was attached when matters of his professional work were being discussed, do you classify that as fair comment? It is not fair comment. You understand that. Why? Because it, will, it, it is not reasonably linked to whatever you are trying to say. So we are saying that fair comment will mean that any commentary that you pass on a story, okay, that is of public interest. And that is also reasonable and relevant to the fact can also be used or you can bring the defense of what? Fair comment. Hope you're okay. All right. So to this point, we have discussed the defenses, at least. Absolute privilege, justification, qualified privilege, and when there is malice, how all those things, malice comes out, how you can use it for the defense. We get that. The final part on this section that we are going to speak about briefly is what would be the remedy? The remedies for defamation. Let's say that the, per the person does not want to actually even, he is caught in the statement, okay? So what, what, what do we do? Okay, the, there's an action against defamation brought against him. He realized that he cannot really mount a very solid defense. Maybe he didn't really, he looks at it and all the four defenses, you don't really, you're not kind of very solid. So what are the remedies? What do you do in an action for defamation like that? Okay. Now, we talk about a very simple one. One of the remedies for defamation in an action that has brought against defamation, that is not a defense. Guys, let, let's make that distinction clear. The defense is that you are trying to bring up a statement to repel the action for defamation. A remedy is what you are trying to do to mitigate the kind of damage that is intended. Okay? One of the most powerful remedies or that, that really helps is retraction and apologies. Retraction and apologies. What do you mean by retraction and apology? Now, the civil procedure rules, CI 47, that is the rules that govern the way actions are taken in court, has a very important idea to give us about how retraction and apology can have an effect, uh, can have a, a remedial effect on defamation. Order 57, Rule 5. This is what it says in Order 57, Rule 5 of CI 47. Order 57, Rule 5, Sub Rule 1A. It says, In an action for libel published in any public newspaper or other periodical publication, the defendant may pay, may after paying into court, a sum of money by way of amends, plead by way of defense that, B, before the commencement of the action or at the earliest opportunity afterwards, the defendant inserted in that newspaper or periodical publication a full apology for the libel. Or if that newspaper or periodical publication is ordinarily published at intervals exceeding one week, that the defendant had offered to publish the apology in any newspaper or periodical publication to be selected by the plaintiff. Did you notice what was stated in Order 57 of the CI 47 rules? We are saying that if an action for defamation has been brought against a defendant, the defendant can plead in his defense that at the earliest opportunity, he had offered to make an apology, okay, in a retraction and etc. that was to be published in the case of libel. Now, Order 57 is giving us an, a sense of some of the remedies that could be taken when there is defamation, retraction and apology. Okay, at the earliest opportunity. So when a matter comes up and someone is seeking to bring an action for defamation, one of the things that could be relied on, not as a defense, but as a remedial step, is to offer an apology and retraction. We see many radio stations and media houses use that a lot when inadvertently they felt that some particular individuals whose stories had come up before them were defamed. Let's take note that the offer of apology and retraction doesn't take away the defamation. What it only seeks to do is to, for example, reduce the amount of damages that would actually be occasioned if the action had gone through full trial. Also, it may to extent, depending on the gravity or how the plaintiff feels he has been offended by it, probably moving on some kind of humane grounds to seek to just bring an end to the action for defamation. Beyond that, Re apologies and all those things do not necessarily take away the defamation suit. And like the rules actually say, what it does is to mitigate the amount of damages that will be brought against the defendant. Said that if the damages were this high, it would probably be reduced to another level, uh, a much more lower level, 
for it to be well considered. Okay, so I hope you understand all that we've discussed on the defenses of defamation.